Aloha, everybody. Aloha, Oh, that sounds like it came straight from your heart. Thank you very much. It's good to be back. We just updated everyone on the wonderful outreach up in Oregon. And we are now in chapter 14 of John's Gospel. Let's pray and start together. Father, thank you for the words that we're about to read and study together are true. They're not only from your heart and lips, but they've been written and recorded for us right here on this day in July of 2023 for us to bring our burdens, our cares directly to you. For you too love our eyes and hands and nose and toes, and you love our hearts and you want us to know even in difficult days, the love you have for us. So we open up completely to that very truth in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Well, here we are in the 14th chapter, just a couple of reminders as we study it today. We are in the last 24 hours of Jesus life on earth and the remaining of the book is dedicated, especially 14, 15, 16, 17. In 24 hours, Jesus will be on the cross and he will die and be placed in a tomb. So every encounter we read about as they're in the upper room and, and uh, he's already been betrayed, every encounter we read about is so important uh, to capture the final details he has to his disciples and therefore us. And with that environment now set, that atmosphere set, we have seen him say, one of you will betray me. And one of them has already. Jesus has left the room. So now it's Jesus with the 11. Judas has left the room. And Jesus is with the 11. And with all of the talk of leaving and betrayal, and I'm not with you much longer, can you imagine the condition of their hearts. Could you imagine the fear and the wondering after they've committed these three years to follow him? And can you imagine as he even speaks these words, how much it was needed, but not fully understood till later. He begins this great chapter with a verse many of you have memorized. He says to them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God believe also in me. To troubled hearts, he speaks, don't be troubled. To hearts uncertain, to hearts not comprehending, to hearts witnessing these things and hearing their teacher, he says, let not your heart be troubled. I love the reality that he already understands they are troubled. We all get troubled. The things of this earth make us very anxious, but the offer is constant and ever ready from Jesus. Don't let that happen to you. Don't let your heart be troubled, even when you don't understand. And even though painful things happen, of course you will be troubled, but bring that trouble to me. And this is why he says, you, you're following me because you already believe in God, but personalize that, believe also in me. And he has already claimed the deity. He has already claimed to be God himself. The Father and I are one. You've heard the dialogues. You've heard the different teachings. So he is reassuring troubled hearts to say, now you can actually put this into application. You can engage in this. Don't let your heart be troubled. Instead, here's the solution. Instead, you believe in God, believe also in me because I'm the one that God sent and I am God himself. God in flesh is saying, I've got this. God in flesh right before them, still in that room is saying, even though times are very difficult, I'm with you. Believe also in me. It's a good word for our day and age, isn't it? Not a week goes by that we don't see things that we've not seen before. Conversations that are incredible shaking the earth at every movement, wondering how we get to this place. It's very nice to hear Jesus say, let your heart not be troubled. Let not it be troubled because I'm here. I'm with you. 
Part of the reason we meet on Sunday morning is not just to have wonderful worship and time together as a church family and teaching, but as we do this, we hopefully, and throughout the week, we grow closer to Jesus. I wanna be as close as I can to Jesus to hear him say, hey, Mark, don't let your heart be troubled. And then I often respond, but Jesus, this is very troubling. I know, but I've got you. Don't let your heart be troubled. I'm working through this. And then look what he throws in at verse two. He just says, here's one reason, a great reason. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. I'm not gonna rabbit trail on this, but some versions, English standard version says rooms. Um, and people go really sideways that, wait, I've been following Christ all my life and all I'm gonna get is a cubicle, you know, or a small room. I guarantee you, you will be very pleased. And not only a mansion, he says, many mansions. My father's house are many mansions. We know all about the streets of gold. We know descriptions of heaven, but there are mansions for us to dwell in. So don't let your heart be troubled, even though things are troubling on this earth. I, I, and he tells us he'll go there in, in a few moments. But in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I've got good news for you. This place of heaven has a dwelling place for you for all eternity and all the pain is gone, all the suffering, all the things that trouble hearts. So one of the reasons Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. He says, I have a place for you, dwelling place, many places, many mansions. And if that wasn't true, I would have told you. Jesus has told us he's got a place for us. I love that. I love it for the confidence it gives me as a pastor as I minister to dying people, even deathbed experiences. I can simply say, as you put your faith in Christ, listen to this, he's got a place for you. He will meet you there. And then he tells the disciples who are troubling with all of what's going on, he says this, I'm going to prepare a place for you, all of you, many mansions, I'm going ahead, that troubles you, I know, but I'm going ahead with a purpose to prepare a mansion for you. And again, you could echo, if it wasn't true, he wouldn't tell us. Or he would have told us that's not true. But he's saying, this is part of what the next step is. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, here's the other promise. Guess what? I'm gonna come back again. I'm going to prepare a personal place for you, many mansions, and when that is complete, I am coming back for you. I go to prepare a place, and if I go, I come back for you. I'll come again and receive you to myself. Now, if you're a non-believer reading this, it's probably not gonna connect real well until you understand the personal relationship. When he says, I will come back and receive you to myself. He is speaking to believers. He's speaking in this context to his disciples. But the wonderful promise and the wonderful encouragement comes that, hey, I'm going away, I'm preparing a place, then I'm gonna come back, receive you, in other words, take you and to myself, and where I am, there you will be also. That's the promise of Jesus. Believe in me. You believe in God, believe in me, because I'm coming back and I'm going to prepare a place and take you there. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. There's a little assumption there as Jesus says, we've been talking about this. And now's the time when I'm getting ready to leave. In the next 24 hours, things are gonna change radically. And he ends it by saying, and where I go, you know. Where I go to heaven, you know about it. God's talked about it in the Old Testament. We've talked about it. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. That's a setup. <laughs> That's a setup because there's gonna be a response. The way to get where I'm talking about is, well, you know. You know because you believe me, you know you've heard. But the shock of the news, when you have a troubled heart, it can get cloudy, it can get confusing, it can become emotional. And it's Thomas that speaks up and he said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. He just said, you know the way. We do not where you know where you are going and how can we know the way? This is all too much for me. This is all confusing. And Jesus responds to that question 
And he says, I am the way, Thomas. Responding to Thomas, he responds to anyone that has that concern. In this wonderful sixth verse, Jesus says, I am the way. But not only the way there, Thomas, I am the truth and I am the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm telling you absolute truth. I'm showing you the way. And I'm not just saying I'm the way to life, but I am the life. I am the life that you need. Everything else is secondary. Don't let your heart be troubled. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And then Jesus adds this on to verse six, that goes counter to our culture, counter to many cultures of the past, and certainly counter to future days. He just said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And in that very exclusive statement, he counters the culture of many ways to God and says, there's only one way to God, and it's right through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And as a matter of fact, no one gets to God but by me. People don't like that, do they? They don't like the very thought that it's so restrictive. There are many roads to God, they often say. There are many uh, options, many doors. The cults teach it. Some mainline religions now teach it. Well, that's a good road for you. And I'm glad you found your Jesus. But there are many ways to God. Jesus is either absolutely crazy or he's absolutely true. And certainly he is because he just said, the way, the truth, and the life, no one gets to heaven. No one gets to God by me. That That is never puzzled. Well, first of all, I, I like the very fact that Jesus never caves to culture. Culture changes constantly. Culture has different ideas of God. Right now, they have different ideas of humanity. They change their ideas of humanity. They try and change their humanity. God is consistent all the way through. And I've never had an issue with the second part of that verse, no one comes to the Father except through me. Because if you understand salvation, even in human terms, that you understand many different times in our experiences, there's only one way for salvation. This month of July marks five years since that, if you'll go back with me, five years since that sports team of 12 boys went swimming in a Thailand cave and were stuck there for days, the tide came up and they were stuck. The world fixated on it. World, the the, the uh, world was sending different options Divers, professionals, and, and it was the professional divers that finally timed it. And I get claustrophobic even thinking about that story. Timed it to come out at the right time with each boy and they took tanks in and one of the rescuers was killed in the process. I believe he had a heart attack. Yeah. Sacrificed his life for these boys. If I say to you, I wonder why they didn't take another way out. I mean, I wonder why they didn't use dynamite and dynamite a big hole right above them. I wonder why they didn't have uh, seven other options. There was only one way out. The other way is death, drowned by drowning. And those boys were saved because they went, the rescuer was sent. Their salvation came because they were taken out through the only way. Can I say it this way? The only truth. And that gave them their life. So I don't have an issue when the truth comes from the word of God and says there's only one way and it's through Jesus. That is truth. You can debate it. You can deny it. But in the end, salvation only comes through Christ. So they are hearing that. They are hearing the example of Jesus himself saying this is how it works. And in the entire time he is revealing the father. Listen to his words as it increases now. Verse seven, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. You're looking at me, God's son, the father and I are one. 
And he's intensifying the reality that you have to understand that I am God because I am the only way you will be saved. Philip interrupts or in interjects and said to him, Lord, show us the Father. He just said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The Father and I are the same. He says, listen, show us the Father and that'll do it for us. That'll be sufficient for us. Just show us God. Got a picture? Pull out your phone, swipe it. God, just show us God. That This can be settled really easy, Philip says. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? I've walked with you. You've seen the miracles. You've seen, heard my teaching. Have I been with you all this time and you have not known me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how is it you can say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, not on some radical independent mission, but I speak from the authority of God. But the Father who dwells in me does the work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. You can either take it by faith or look at the evidence. Best to do both. You've been with me all along. You're my disciples. And you must understand that the Father and I are one. It's intriguing when you look at the words of Jesus. I've often wondered if the uh, humanity of his frustration comes out in some of those words. I think he's more concerned about truth as he's departing and getting ready to leave. But it is a reality to Jesus because he's preparing a place called heaven and he's preparing it specifically for them. And they're still kind of saying, show us the father. How, what way do you go? I don't quite understand. And in 24 hours left, he must emphasize this. And so he does. Years ago when I was in Ethiopia on a World Vision outreach, uh, we, we first go to Nairobi, Kenya. I was a youth pastor at the time. This was 1988. So the whole we are the world you know, movement had just gone and everyone was focusing on Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, sending so much food that it sat out on those barges and rotted, you know, because they would see these images of young children with bloated stomachs. And it was just a horrific time. So I went there as a follow-up and uh, our church was involved, our youth group was involved and some other youth pastors. And I met another youth pastor named Mark as uh, was the opportunity. And Mark was a different type of youth pastor in the sense that he didn't have a church building. He didn't have a structure to reach youth people. He worked at the Dandora dump, which is a landfill set up by some world system some 30 years plus back. And the poorest of the poor lived and worked out of the dump. And so he would go in, like we do with Spectrum Ministries and Tijuana Dump, and he would go in every day and they would try and get a meal for them as they scavenged through the dump. And so I was hearing about his ministry and I said, Mark, what, what would be the biggest difference in your youth ministry versus my youth ministry? And we're both about the same age. And you know, I'm in America, you're here at this dump in outside Nairobi. Without hesitation, I never forget his words. He said, oh, easy. You don't need God. I said, excuse me? He said, you don't need God. You have all the resources. You have all the big screen TVs to show videos to the youth. You have all the camps and entertainment. You don't need God. He said, we get up at four in the morning and we pray till five in the morning on our knees and saying, God, if you don't intervene here, these kids won't be fed. If you don't provide something from outside coming from your hands, these kids won't be ministered to. So he said, you can do your ministry without God very easily. 
but we absolutely depend on God. And it stayed with me as I've told you till this day. There's a lot of ministry happening in America that really doesn't need God. Some clearly that don't want God. And we can easily fall into the support of other people, of other organizations, and, and really just say, oh, it's run this way for years. But someone that is absolutely dependent on God has a different view and a different understanding. And that's where Jesus is trying to take these men. You don't understand it all. You don't understand the theology of it. You don't understand heaven. I'm telling you, you believe in me and I will get you there. Whether you understand it on this earth or not, you need God. And I am God, Jesus says. He goes on in verse 12 and says, most assuredly, I say to you, this is how important the belief is. I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also and greater works than these he will do because I go to the father. That's a verse that's quite often taken out of context. Some circles will meet on Sundays and say, oh, look, we can do greater things than Jesus, more spectacular things than Jesus. But he's really talking about the magnitude. As a matter of fact, it would be just some days later that the message from Peter at Pentecost would go forth and more people would be saved at that message of Pentecost than all of Jesus' earthly ministry up to that point. He's talking about the magnitude. You need to believe in me because you're going to go forward and the magnitude of believers that trust in God will spread throughout the earth. Six billion, seven billion. There's right now somewhere in the range of a billion people that pro profess Christ. I don't know if they're all born again, but they profess Christ. That, that's the, the magnitude of this, Jesus said. You will be the ones to carry this message. You will go at the Great Commission. You will go out and share what I am sharing. So you must believe in me. You have to be absolutely <laughs> dependent on me and nobody else. Because I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then he says this statement too that often gets taken in abuse in prayer. And whatever you ask, as you're going out, as you're sharing, as you're praying, whatever you ask in my name, keep that term in my name, in mind, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, and if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So there's a little verse that people take out of the Bible, and they twist it to their own meanings. And they say, oh, I've got this little secret code, so Lord, I want a brand new car in Jesus' name. Or I want to be wealthy in Jesus. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. It's not what Jesus says. To pray in Jesus' name is to say, I surrender my will and I accept your will. So whatever I'm praying for in your name, even a healing, I'm trusting you know better, God, Either over finances, over relationships, over whatever it is, I surrender it to you in Jesus' name. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Now, don't misunderstand. There's power in Jesus' name. And we are to pray in Jesus' name, but we understand as we do, the power comes in our surrender and the Spirit of God unleashed into whatever he does. So now I pray, Lord, as I reach out to people, it's not about my agenda but it's this magnitude of proclaiming your truth that matters. My agenda, I, I would quite honestly want to do that. I would become very selfish if it's Mark talking and just say, well, I'm in. Good luck, everybody. But when the Spirit of God takes over our life and breaks our hearts as Jesus is talking about and says, you trust me completely, then we say we're on a mission in Jesus' name and we will go wherever Jesus sends us to speak to whoever he has arranged and that message started all the way back with his disciples. Absolutely dependent on God. I remember driving home from the dump that night late in Nairobi, sharing that experience with others and saying, boy, I don't want to meet kids with the resources of California or a church budget. I want to meet kids and reach kids with the life-changing message 
that only works when I'm absolutely dependent on God. And that's really how we operate here. Dependent on God, he provides facilities, he provides finances, faithful people that give and share, he provides encouragement, ministry. But what it does do for us, and I'll close with this, famous words of preacher at the end of the sermon, I'll close with this. When we do that, not only do we grow in our faith with him, but he takes us to a greater magnitude. So a small church can impact worlds apart from where we sit this morning, in dumps, at festivals, at the harbor, in our homes and neighborhoods, at hospital beds, wherever God sends us. Let's pray together that Jesus would take our troubled hearts as he has promised to do and let them be entrusted to him. Father, as we close our time in the first half of this chapter, knowing you have so much more instruction, we would like to declare to you that we are absolutely dependent on you. And in the areas where we are not, where we're always growing, where our hearts get troubled, we would ask you to help us be brought there. More faith, more trust, more personal time with you, Jesus, the study of your word, the refilling of your spirit, the releasing and confessing of sin that only pushes us away from you instead of drawing a close, us closer to you. And me, in every opportunity we have, we are just so clear that saying, God, this is not about me, but it's about you. I yield myself to you and I pray it all in your name. I commit it in your name and I ask for your will to be done. We pray that together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bob's going to close us out today. Apologize for that. We're awake. Sorry, folks. That, that had to have not been good. Um, Oh, oh, oh.
Father. 